It is good to see you here tonight. I thank you for being here. You can see right off that we're a little bit different schedule. I am so glad that we're together in this room, even in limited numbers. But by the fact that I'm here instead of our pastor, uh, and I'm glad to be here, somewhat glad to be here because that means our pastor is taking a few minutes off. Sometimes when I'm here to start, that means he's on his way home from Mobile or Birmingham. He's been gone all day or he had a funeral or been in the hospital. But today, he is just with his family. And so you pray for him. Uh, Thomas and I talked a little bit earlier this week. Thomas is going to speak Sunday. In fact, several months ago, when it seemed like the entire nation shut down, Micah's work got busier and busier and busier. He never missed a Sunday morning preaching. Now, you didn't always see it because we weren't always in this room. Sometimes he was speaking at 10 o'clock and we were recording it for later. Sometimes it was Friday morning. Sometimes it was Thursday afternoon. He never missed a Sunday night doing some kind of Bible study. And then in recent weeks, he's been leading us through that incredible Christian classic, Pilgrim's Progress. He never missed a Wednesday night. We've been, uh, recent weeks, he's been teaching through the book of First Samuel. And then on top of that, at one stretch during that for 10 weeks, Monday through Friday, that's 50 days, 50 days, he did a short devotional that was recorded and made available to the church. Those were incredible to me to think that he could actually preach a sermon in five or six minutes, and he didn't have to actually go for an hour. Micah, you listening? I don't know if... Thomas is sending this to Mike or not. But anyway, so we're here tonight, and uh, I'm glad you're here. Thomas uh, tells me we may have air conditioner Sunday. Is that? Shake your head, Thomas. Oh, yes. Look at that head nodding. Oh, my goodness. Hopefully. (laughs) No, don't. That's why we've been here for two months. Should seriously, we should have air conditioner Sunday. These are some other just announcement things. Sorry, we don't have a messenger to put in your hand. Heather ordinarily does that on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, her Emma had gone to Montgomery today to see Heather's father, who is not well. He has cancer, and uh, on the way home, her car started acting up, so she stopped in Greenville. And Harvey and Heather drove to Greenville to get her and get her car home. So she will do something tomorrow. I don't know if that means, Thomas, you'll put it out online or as an email. or they, And there may be some printing copies on those tables in the back. She asked me to continue to remind you that we are still doing shoebox ministry. If you have last week's messenger, you'll know what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to buy or bring or pack your own box. And then I reminded you that... Uh, Micah is with his family. And then I'll just, this will come later. Uh, Phil is going to pray for us later. But I'll remind you to pray for our schools. If you've seen the afternoon paper or you saw a note online, our public schools will not start as they had just announced a week or two ago they would start. Uh, they, They will do school but it won't be that traditional school going down the hall to their classrooms. And I just cannot even imagine all of the headaches and all the things that have to be taken care of. So pray for those folks. Uh, I think the Monroe Academy still has a starting date to go in the regular classrooms, I think. Uh, But you pray for all of those folks. And you may say, well, I don't have children in the school anymore. But you know somebody who teaches. And when that person comes across your mind, you stop and pray for them. If you see a kid in your neighborhood and you know they go to school somewhere, pray for them. Uh, Pray for the folks who may be, you know, wishing they had a job and could go back to work. There will be people who have lost jobs through all of this because of this uh, business that we're in. So a lot of things to think about, a lot of things that you can be involved in. Now, have prayer concerns. In a moment, David Lazenby is going to lead us in this prayer. But I want you to remember, and I'm sorry you don't have a printed page in front of you, but Shirley Horton has been away from home, I think, surely at this point, four months. Surely she is. You know, she spent weeks and months in the hospital in Pensacola. Her daughter, Deborah, was able to check her out of there and take her to Florida to her home. I think after two days there, or maybe one day, she was back in the hospital down there. She spent several days in the hospital. 
I don't hear from Deborah every day, but I think at this point she is out of the hospital at Deborah's house. So remember, Shirley, uh, I talked with our friend Carl Jackson this afternoon. He is somewhat better, uh, but he still uh, struggles at times. He'll have two or three good days and then a bad day. He is on oxygen, some at home. And uh, when he left Mobile Infirmary, their biggest concern was that they had weaned him off of his oxygen, so he wouldn't have to start over with that. But his breathing has been difficult enough that they have uh, put him back on oxygen at some point. I mentioned Heather's father has cancer, and uh, those girls, Heather has two sisters. Those ladies are taking turns uh, seeing their daddy and spending time with him. And uh, she told me today that he had sat all three of them down at different times to talk to them about, you know, what's coming. And uh, so the girls compared notes, and he had the speech perfect. He told them all three exactly the same things. And I know those are difficult times, but I told her it's very mature in your family to go ahead and talk about those things that have to be talked about. So I remember her, and as I made some notes about Heather, uh, I was reminded also that our Beth, our Jonathan's wife, her father is dying as well. He has cancer. Uh, Beth to him recent days. They tried to get him into a uh, hospice care unit for his final days. But you know how this works. He had to be tested for the virus. He tested positive, and so they would not admit him. So he literally will spend his last days at home. And the children had to be tested. Beth tested negative, but she now has to go home and have a 14-day period of her own at her house. So just pray for them. It's a very similar situation that Heather's going through, uh, in a real sense, waiting on uh, their father to die. So pray for them. Phil and Becky and I talked a while ago, the fact that if so many families who have experienced death in recent weeks and months, during this awkward time, we have two more this week. Kenny Riles' mother died this week, early Monday. There's a graveside service today. Miss Ann Bullock, who is Dorothy Crawford's mother and also Geraldine Bullock's mother, uh, died over the weekend. There was a there was a visitation time here yesterday, but then uh, there was a graveside service for Ms. Bullock in uh, Marengo County. And Micah talks occasionally about not being able to read my writing. And the truth is, I can't read it myself sometimes. I probably have... <laughs> David Jones, I hear you laughing the loudest. And... Uh, just pray, continue to pray for our friends. I see Wayne Holly on the back row. These are difficult days. I saw the other day, it's been a month since Cliff Parker's wife died. It's been two months since Laura Holly died. And uh, it will get easier. They will tell you it will get easier. But in the meantime, it's still very, very difficult. Uh, so I want us to stop here for a moment before I start my Bible study. Phil? All right. remember him. And I mentioned Carl. You know, we have other folks in our church who have been sick with this virus. Phil and Becky have been sick with this. I think KJ and Julie Lazenby have both been sick. Others have been sick. I'm sure I'll forget some of their names. The reason I say that, my wife has been out quite a bit in recent weeks. She also has had this virus. And uh, it certainly, for Sherry, was not life-threatening uh, probably because she had the best home health care in the world. You just can't imagine how good home health care was as me. Uh, but she was a sick lady for two long, long weeks. She's on the mend. She's not here tonight because of that. We have a grandbaby at our house. But uh, she's still very, very weak at times. So all those folks, uh, you pray for those. David Lazenby. Lord, we just thank you for life. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. 
continue to lead us. I ask you to speak through Glenn tonight and let us hear your word. God, help us to listen, help us to obey, help us to love you and trust you with all our heart and soul. And Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Did somebody else have something you wanted to say before I started? You okay? All right, this is what we're going to pray some more in a moment as I get into our Bible study. Uh, I told you that Micah reminded you that Micah has been teaching through the uh, first, first Samuel. This really, I'm, I'm going to be in the book of Psalms tonight, and this really could be a continuation of his teaching because if you were here last week or if you listened to it online to speak, I did have a pastor one time who asked me to cover for him. And I said, okay, I surely will. He said, now, what I want you to do, I want you to come by my office and pick up the notes that I have. And I literally had to preach his sermon for that Sunday. And I always felt so awkward. I wanted to say, can I use my own stories? Do I have to read these stories that you had told me to read in your sermon? So Micah at least lets me do my own stuff. All right. We're in the Psalms, and uh, I, I would raise the question for you, why the Psalms? Well, for me, this summer, Sherry and I, we don't sit down together in the mornings to do our Bible study and reading, but we do have the same plan. And so at some point early in the summer, we both were reading through the book of Psalms, our summer morning time. Uh, and it takes, even if you read five chapters a day, it takes a month to read the Psalms. Some days we didn't read five chapters. When you get to Psalms 119, you don't read five chapters that day. In fact, we split that chapter up into two or three days. It is the longest chapter in the Bible. But the Psalms for me, as, as a rule, are very encouraging to me. They're devotional. They're worshipful. Now, I know Micah has taught through some of these as well, and he would remind you that some of them are not worshipful and quiet and encouraging. Some of them are moments when David was praying that God would bring down his wrath on the enemies of David, the enemies of God's kingdom. But for what I'm talking about tonight, I'm talking about those encouraging moments. And I'm reminded, and you should be reminded too, that David and others who wrote the Psalms, they were well acquainted with problems in life, just like we are. They were acquainted with the joys in life, the frustrations in life, disappointments in life. They were well acquainted with issues and personal relationships and issues and national and international and political issues as well. These that I share tonight, they're not in any kind of order. We're certainly not starting at the first chapter and going through there. You stay with me. I think some of them will be psalms that have been encouraged to you along the way. We start with the 133rd Psalm. It's a short one. I read this earlier in the summer. In fact, I, I spoke to my choir, sent them an email when I'd read this because I was reminded first of my granddaddy Watley, my mother's daddy. He was a godly man, and my brother and I would stay with them sometimes a couple of days, several days, sometimes a week in the summer. And uh, my brother and I, whether we were at granddaddy's house or at home, we just fought like cats and dogs all the time. And I'm sure, I, I don't know why, we just did. And I'm not saying we argued, we fought. It, it would come to fists, you know, and he was a little older and a little bigger, but I was so stubborn and determined I was going to go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. So it was one of those days, I'm sure, my granddaddy had had enough. So he sat us down at lunch. We were all set to go back outside and continue our fussing and fighting. He sat down, and he made us memorize the 133rd Psalm. Now, it's only three verses, but for a little kid... It may as well have been three pages. I was so, I just could not stand it. Now, I can't remember all of it, but to this day, and this has been 60 years ago, I remember the first verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. I had no idea at seven years old he was trying to teach me to be a peacemaker and to be loving and kind to my brother. I just knew we were having to memorize it and spit it back to him so we can go out and play. But it was a good one. Uh, I, so when I read that this summer, I remember Granddaddy. He's been dead a long time. I remember my brother, who's also been dead for several years. But then quickly, quickly, God moved my thoughts from Granddaddy in a childhood memory 
to the current state of our nation. Chaos, rioting, disease, people fighting, literally fighting over whether or not you're supposed to wear a mask in the store. People have just lost their minds. So I began praying that day, like I have been praying all spring and summer, probably like you've been praying, that God would bring peace and unity and health and healing to our country, to our state, our community, and to our church, make it locally. So listen to those few verses, and then we're going to pray. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. There's an exclamation point in my book there. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. There's this beautiful picture here of oil and quiet and spiritual calm that just overflows. And it literally, from your head to your shoulders, your hair, all the way to the hem of your robes. The last verse said, it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, and the blessing, life forever. That's a reference, that verse right there is a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, where there was talk, God's blessing upon his people. And I've asked Phil Snyder to pray right now for those issues facing our country. We're, we're in a mess. We're just in a mess. So you pray with Phil as he leads us in prayer. in our lives, in our hearts. And we don't know peace unless we know you. And we can't have peace unless we know you. And I just pray that as your people who are called by your name, that we would be examples to our world around us, in our communities, in our homes, to promote peace, to, to promote unity, to to be peacemakers. Um, Father, uh, teach us. Teach us that. Help us to find that in your word. Help, teach us and talk to us through your word on how to mend and, and how to encourage our lawmakers and how to encourage our elected officials to be peacemakers, to bring this country back together. To bring this country back to you is what we need to be doing. God, I, I, I pray for all these that are, are sick, all these that are, are uh, wandering without jobs, without hope, without uh, assurance, that, God, that we would, we would show them the answers, that we would be uh, lighthouses that they could run to. Find what they need to find. Father, help us to be um, not held up and, and, and masked up and, and afraid to contact anybody, but help us to be outgoing and help us to show people that that this can happen. This can happen, but it's got to happen through you. And Father, I just pray that this group of believers, this body that meets here, I'm, I am, like David, I'm so thankful that we can meet. I'm, I miss my family. I miss my, my brothers and sisters. But we don't need to stay in these walls and just feed off each other. We need to feed our community. And I just pray that we would do that, that we would be peacemakers. Start in my heart right now to do that. And I ask these things in your son's precious holy name. Amen. Thank you, Phil. The eighth psalm is one of my very, very favorites. <clears throat> it's not very long. I'll read the, read the entire psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth, who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of thine adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man 
you're mindful of him, and the Son of Man, that you take care of him. Yet you've made them a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and majesty. You've made him to rule over the works of thy hands. You've made, you put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the deeps of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. I, want, I feel like I want to sing when I come to this psalm. Two, two hymns come to mind. One is in the book. In fact, part of both of these hymns are in this book. Michael W. Smith's song, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. I just love that hymn. Oh, my goodness. And then also the choir. Many, many, many times through the years. In fact, before I came here, A.B. had this choir singing the majesty and glory of your name. There are times in that beautiful uh, song where it just quoting literally the words right out of the eighth psalm. I don't think there's any place in the scripture that would lead us to worship any more than that particular psalm. And it ends the way it starts. There are bookends of praise on this psalm. Verse 1 and verse 9 are exactly the same. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, we're so close to the beginning. Let's go to the first chapter. The very first psalm, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. It starts off on that negative side. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's a simple, simple picture here of the godly person about what he is not supposed to do, how he's not supposed to act, and then how he is supposed to act, how he is supposed to live. You'd be reminded the godly person does not, does not, should not, <laughs> should not walk with the wicked or stand with sinners or seat with the scoffers, be seated with the scoffers. There's a progression there. I've heard pastors who are much better at, than me of describing this progression. It's one thing to be walking along and you're, you know, bumping shoulders with, you know, the dregs of society, sinful people who will drag you down. It's one thing. You're going to be those. You're going to see those people, whether you work with them or see with them, the neighbors, your people you live with. That's one thing. But then when you actually stop what you're doing and just stand there, Chew the fat with him for 15 or 20 or 30 minutes, and you're hearing all of this evil that this person is spouting over. You're not just passing by on the streets. Now you've taken the time to stop and listen to what that person says. And then the rest of that progression, ha, huh, let's just sit down and see what we can do here. And you sit down, and all of a sudden you've wasted the rest of the day listening to what should be done or could be done that Satan is all a part of. Uh, my mother never preached to me in the sense that she quoted the verses to me, but she she preached this to me so much because she would always talk to me about being careful who I was hanging out with, being careful where I was going, and all that stuff. And uh, I was like most kids. I didn't want to hear it. And, you know, I've raised kids that didn't want to hear it as well, but we as parents still have to keep on that stuff. So, you know, we talked about that negative progression, but then... The simple progression of the godly person is that he delights in the law, that is the scripture. He meditates on it day and night. Don't pat yourself on the back like I do because you get up every day for a week and read your Bible and you spend 15 or 20 or 30 minutes. It says he meditates day and night. And then it also, the promise there is that he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. And then verse 6, the end of that says, the Lord knows, or he approves, or he has regard for the way of the righteous. But, but, 
the way of the wicked will perish. Psalms 31 uh, needs no introduction. It doesn't need any explanation from me. Listen to the first five verses of Psalm 31. I'm reading tonight from the New American Standard. Uh, for the most part at home, I'm reading from the New International Version. As a child, probably if you're my age or older, we read from the King James Version. So when I got to the Psalms this summer, I didn't necessarily go back to the King James, but I had this old, old New American Standard that does read to me as though I'm rereading it from my childhood. And this is from Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In thy righteousness, deliver me. Incline thine ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be thou to me a rock of strength a stronghold to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. For thy name's sake, thou wilt lead me and guide me. Thou wilt pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Isn't that an incredible sense of security there? A few verses again from Psalm 32, the very next one. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to thee and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. There's the Psalm of David. Uh, that little bit in the, in the middle of that where he wants to keep quiet about his sin, he wants to just kind of brush it under the rug, he doesn't talk about it. And he said, because of that, his vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of the summer. We know about heat and humidity here and how it drains the very life out of you. And the picture there to me is that as we as believers, if we don't keep ourselves up to date with God and what's expected of us, we're going to fall along the way just as well. Psalms 103 is another one of those psalms that has been put to music so many, many, many times. The first few verses. In fact, you could say this with me if you have your text or if you don't. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Say it again with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And again, uh, there's a hymn we sing, I think it's number 22, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And then, uh, Thomas, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think Matt Redman wrote that great song, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. It's taken from that verse in the 103rd Psalm. Psalms 119. Now, I won't do like Micah did when he started teaching through the book of Hebrews. You know, we read the entire book that day. I had little grandchildren with me that day. So they were so good. We're sitting on the front row, and Micah read for about an hour that morning. So we got out of church. I said, you can go home and tell your daddy that your Bubba's pastor read the entire Bible today in church. She just rolled her eyes. She knew it. he'd done a lot of reading, though. This is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's 176 verses. It's I think it's 22 eight-verse stanzas. And it all really talks about the Scripture and how we're supposed to feast on the Scripture. The second section is where I'll read verses 9 to 16. It starts with a question, how can a young man 
and I'd make it personal for all of us. How can a young man or an old man or a young woman or an old woman or a child or in between, how can those people keep their way pure? That's the question. How can a young man keep his way pure? And then for the rest of those eight verses, it answers. By keeping it according to thy word. With all my heart, I have sought thee. Do not let me wander from thy commandments. Thy word, this is a verse that we have sung also. Thy word is, no, that's not it. This is the verse that says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on thy precepts and regard in thy ways. I shall delight in thy statutes. I shall not forget thy word. So how can we keep our way pure? By staying in the word. I shall not forget the word. Just a couple of more. Psalms 91. In my book, your, your book may have titles under as you begin these psalms. The, the title for this one in my text says, Security of the One Who Trusts in the Lord. Psalms 91. Let me read the first seven verses. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty and have an old, old personal note that I put in there in years past. It just simply says, let me live here. This is where I want to be. Let me live here. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand by your right hand, but it shall not approach you. And then the, the last couple of verses of this text, you go from a, a person writing those words that God would have them write, the inspired words, to what I, has to be God himself speaking here. Listen to this. The whole tra the transition is there. It has to be there. Verse 14, because he has loved me, this is God speaking, because he has loved me, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him behold my salvation. That's where I want to be. Oh, my goodness. That's where I want to be. Well, we finish with the, surely the most familiar of the Psalms, the 23rd Psalm. And I want us to read it together in a minute. What I want you to do so we'll all have the same translation. Find a hymnal in front of you. Uh, this would actually be listed as what should have been the first hymn in the book. The first hymn in the book is Holy, 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 but that's number two. Number one is the print of uh, the 23rd Psalm from the old King James Version. We'll all have the same version. We'll read that in a minute. Uh, but this psalm has always been special to me, but I remember in years past helping a couple of times uh, my friend Kenneth Johnson to, to do funerals. He would preach and I would sing, and I was always mesmerized with him because of the way he had memorized so much scripture. I, I just thought, I, 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 just, I can't tell you. I, I would just sit and talk to him. This is, this is another story, but I have to stop here. I was trying to do some counseling with a high school kid one time, and I'd taken him to McDonald's, and he had devoured the biggest, you know, McNuggets box that I could afford. And I had told him everything godly and scriptural that I knew, and we'd only been there about four minutes. You know, he had already finished his meal, and I didn't know what else to say. But I saw Kenneth Johnson out of the corner of my eye, and he was walking toward us. So I just kind of, hey, Kenneth, Kenneth, would you come here? And I said, uh, I, didn't inter I didn't even introduce him. I didn't tell him what I was doing. I said, Kenneth, what would you say to somebody who is having 
concerns about life. And I told him what the kid, in a sense, what the kid was talking about, concerns about life and death and family and living. And for about five or ten minutes, he sat down without his Bible and started quoting the Scripture to that guy. And I was just, my eyes were bugging out. The little kids were bugging out. I'm sure he was thinking, Mr. Glenn has got this old man in here. He's just preaching to me, and he won't let me get out of my seat. But that was another one of those moments where God, God's Holy Spirit was on that old man because he didn't have to pull out a Bible. The Scripture was part of his life. And I've seen him so many times uh, quote the 23rd Psalm. So all of that to say, when we got this far in the book of Psalms this summer, I said, Bubba, you're a halfway smart guy. You can memorize the 23rd Psalm. And I'm so embarrassed to tell you that as old as I am, I had never committed that to memory. But at this point, on any given day, I can take a pencil and a piece of paper and I can write out the 23rd Psalm while I'm cutting the grass especially. I'm riding. My mind is just free and easy, and I can quote it to myself. Now, please don't ask me to quote it. If you ask me to quote it, I'll, I'll get messed up. But I want to tell you, we'll read it in a minute. But you know, it starts with the, the Lord is my shepherd. Guys, nobody else is our shepherd. No one else. He alone is the shepherd. Not the president, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not the Supreme Court. We'll make it a little more personal. Not your job, not your retirement account, not the Social Security system. Certainly, as we found out this summer, not, not the national health care system. None of these people, none of these institutions are the ones we look to to be our shepherd. Only the Lord our God, the one who is the creator of the world and the one who has made provision for us to spend eternity in heaven with him. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to ask that you stand. You've got it there before you and read it with me. Now you can really put me on the spot because I don't have what you have. But let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Is that right? For his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely... Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hope those words are comforting to you. Sid Chapman, you pray for us as we go, would you?
God bless you. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Hope your week's good.